Welcome everyone, my name is Todd and I'd like to welcome you to New Hope Windward. Thank you for joining us today. We're so glad that you're here. In a few moments, we're going to hear a great message, but before we do, we're going to worship God through our giving. As many of you know, during the month of December, we held our annual Christmas offering with the goal to raise $250,000 to go towards our Christmas offering initiatives. Well, we not only met our goal, we exceeded it. You generously gave a total of over $297,000. Way to go, New Hope Windward. You should be proud of yourselves. So many of you selflessly gave above and beyond to look towards the needs of the broken, hurting, and underprivileged. This year, 100% of your contribution will be given away to our Christmas offering initiatives as we continue to financially support the 22 faith-based ministries and community organizations throughout Hawaii and the world who make it their mission to feed the poor and low-income elderly, care for the homeless, rehabilitate drug addicts, bring healing to youth who've been sexually exploited, and release children from a life of poverty. What matters to Jesus matters to us. So thank you, New Hope Windward, for making it your priority to not just selflessly sacrifice, but to generously share and give to be a tremendous blessing to those whom the Bible says Jesus deeply cares about. In Hebrews 6.10, it says, God will remember all the work you have done. He will remember that you showed your love to Him by helping His people and that you continue to help them. Your generosity is going a long way to make an eternal difference in the lives of others. And God will not forget as it demonstrates your love for Him. At the bottom of the screen, you'll see three easy, safe and secure ways to donate, or you can scan the QR code. Also, by clicking the button on the upper right-hand corner of your screen, it'll take you to our website where you can give a one-time gift or have it recurring. Would you bow your heads with me as I lead us in prayer? Heavenly Father, so many in our church have selflessly and generously shared and given what they have in order to be a blessing to those in need. Your word says that you will remember their sacrifice because they readily give out of a sincere love for you and out of a heart of compassion to help the hurting. So would you take our offering as an ultimate expression of our love for you? In your son's name we pray, amen. Now, if you're joining us for the first time, we're so excited that you're here for service. We have a special welcome gift for you. It's a new Hope Windward stainless steel tumbler. Simply stop by guest services in the lobby after service to pick one up, or you can text the word NEW to 808-736-3777 and we'll mail you a tumbler as our way of saying, welcome to New Hope. We'd love to stay connected with you this week. The easiest way to do that is by following us on social media. As many of you know, February 12th is one of the biggest days for football fans. Yes, it's Super Bowl Sunday, and I'm sure many of you will be having Super Bowl watch parties going on with all the Ono grinds. Well, what better way to kick off the game than by joining us for service at Regal Cinemas for amazing worship and a special message focused on the Super Bowl. Now, we're only going to show this message at our live in-person services at Regal Cinemas that Sunday, so you won't want to miss out. And to add to the fun and excitement of the game, we'll be serving hot dogs and drinks in the lobby after service. Feel free to wear your favorite team's apparel if you want and invite your friends and family to join us on February 12th. What a great way to put God first on Super Bowl Sunday and enjoy one of the best pregame parties before the big game. It's the biggest weekend of the year. Millions of people will huddle around their screens to experience the world's greatest commercials. 30-second theology. It's big ads with bigger truth. Coming soon. All right. Well, hey, it is great to be with you guys and to have you here with us. My name is TJ. I'm uh, on the teaching team here. Thanks. I get... One clap that I pay for, so that's awesome. Yay. All right. Um, hey, before we jump into the message, let me just explain a little bit. Some of you guys, uh, when I came on stage last service, they actually booed me and cheered me at the same time. And I realized it's because of what I'm wearing. And part of the reason is because of what you just saw. Um, in two weeks, we're going to do an experiment we've never done. So I'm excited about this. So I'm going to be speaking that weekend. But what we're going to do is we're actually going to go and we're going to... Um, 
We're going to basically, it's not on football. So it goes, yeah, it's like, I'm not coming in two weeks if this is, we're talking about football in church. It's not about football. My wife does not like to watch football, but what she does like to watch in the Super Bowl is the commercials. So we're going to do something fun. We're basically going to show these 30 second commercials and we're going to talk about some different truths that actually come from scripture, what they look like in real life. I did this in one of my um, theology classes in Bible college, and it was awesome to actually talk about what does this actually feel like. So it'll be a fun weekend. It's an experiment. We'll have chili dogs outside, hot dogs. You can wear whatever jersey you want, even if your team lost and they're not in the Super Bowl. So all you Eagles fans, feel free to wear your jerseys online. Um, they're gonna, yeah, that's right. I went there. And uh, oh, again, this is more life I've ever had in this church. It feels it. Yeah, where I'm from, I'm from Portland, guys. So in Portland, you are either grow up, you're either a 49ers fan or a Sea Chickens fan. So you can tell, getting all the love in that. So, okay, all football stuff aside, feel free if you're watching the game in the room to, like, give me score updates along the way. I know they're playing right now. So I'm proud of you guys for being here. Football aside, it's going to be fun. It's a good time to invite people because it's people think church is, like, undated, doesn't connect to life in that whole vein. We're going to do a pregame thing. We think it's going to be a good thing in two weeks. So it'll be fun. So with that being said, you can grab your Bibles. We're going to jump into the Word today. As we jump into the Word, we're in John 15 today. But I want to start by just telling you a little bit of a story. And it was probably the most nervous I've ever been in my life. Uh, I was having a dinner, and I was sitting down to this dinner, and I was in Colorado of all places. And not like mountain Colorado, like eastern Colorado. It's just flat cornfields if you've been out there. And the house that I was in, you walk outside the house and you literally cannot see houses anywhere. I mean, it's just that remote. And the reason I was there um, is I was there to ask Jules' parents if I could marry her. And you know how, like, you picture yourself being all smooth when you talk and sit down and say it like this. And, I mean, I, I do a lot of public communication. I was terrible. I like botched every word, like sweating and that kind of thing. But like, thank God they say yes, right? So that's all that matters. But like, I still think back to that time, like, man, a lot hinged on that one dinner. Have you guys ever been at a meal and you look back and like, man, I just didn't realize that that one dinner, something was going to happen that was going to change the course of my life. Maybe for you, you were gathered to a dinner and they let you know, your kids, your adult children let you know, hey, you're going to be grandparents. And it was just one of those like, oh, that was just so amazing. Or maybe you're at a dinner and it was like a business deal and you didn't realize it was literally going to change the trajectory of your family. But a lot can happen at one meal. Is that not true? Like sitting in one space, there's a lot that can really just set you on different trajectories. And the reason I bring you up, that up today is today we're going to look at one meal that Jesus had. And it's a meal that there's so, a lot happened at one time. Now, talking to the guys that are church people in the room, I don't think we fully recognize how much happened at this one meal. Now, I'll show you a picture of it. And um, I, I'm not a big art history person, but this is one of the only paintings that I actually know. You know what this painting is? The Last Supper, right? Jesus eating with his disciples on this. My wife was an art history major for a while, so I remember we, we were on our honeymoon. We went to this uh, art museum for like hours, and she's like, you see how the shading here and what they were saying is using this and how it contrasts. I was like, babe, all I see is an apple and like a dude that needs more clothes. Like, I don't get this, you know, but I know this painting. This is the one Da Vinci painted it and it's of Jesus at this dinner we're going to talk about and I'll make it a little HD version of it. But here's what I just want to point out to you. Look at how much happened at this one dinner. Okay. This is the night before he was betrayed, before he laid down his life for us. First thing, this is where Jesus washes the disciples' feet. You guys heard this story of your Christian on that? Okay, this was at the Last Supper. He got down, taught servant leadership what it looks like. This is also where he issued the new commandment. Does anybody know what the new commandment is? Some of you guys are like, uh, it's to a, a new commandment I give you that you should love one another as I have loved you, so you should go love one another. That's John 13, 35. This is also the place where he instituted communion, all at the same dinner. Do this in remembrance of me. It's something that churches have patterned after for thousands of years from one dinner. This is the place that Judas betrays Jesus. Anybody else had a family dinner where drama went down before? Not my family, you know, but like, you're, yeah, like I had one. I can think about some of the ones where it's like in the middle, get up, storm out, like big commotion. This is the same dinner where Judas in the middle of it 
he leaves and betrays Jesus. This is where the promise of the Holy Spirit. And this last one is the one that I think especially a lot of you church people don't realize. And if you do, you're way ahead of me because I never saw this until recently. This is actually the place that he promised a secret to joy. So what do you mean? I'll let you read it for yourself. John 15, 11, these things I've spoken to you, why? So that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be made full. Isn't that crazy? In other words, in the middle of this dinner, he's like, I've told you a ton of things and the reason why I want my joy to be in you and I want that joy to be full. Listen, if you're just joining us, we're in this series called Joyful. And even if you're not a church person, one of the things that I know that all of us are really striving after is to experience joy. Because a lot of times what we're seeking, looking after that, and we're not talking about just kind of like a shallow happiness. We're talking like a soul-satisfying joy. And we want to be able to kind of practice this. And when you come back and you read this, this is what Jesus is talking about. Now, the first thing I want to point out to you is, is this phrase right here. You see this? He says, my joy. So there's going to be a difference between his joy and what we think of when we just say joy. I used to think it's just one whole thing, kind of this, this like emotion or something else. But he says, I've got something very specific. It's kind of like this. Um, has anybody ever driven this car right here? This is uh, one of those like Tesla SUVs that have like the spaceship doors and everything else can drive itself. Now, my, my, one of my buddies got married and he's a car guy. So all of us chipped in for his bachelor party to rent this so we could all drive it for one day. This thing was crazy. I was like in a spaceship, I felt like. Like, this thing has something called ludicrous mode. You'll drive around, you press a button. It's like a turbo boost that takes 30 minutes to power up. When you step on it, it feels like you're on a roller coaster. In like 0 to 2.4 seconds, it gets to 60 miles an hour. It's like, it's just absolutely crazy, okay? Now, let's take this and contrast it with a car that I drive. I drive something that's white and has multiple doors. It's called a Toyota Sienna, and it's an old one. And this Toyota Sienna, you get in my car, it doesn't, the, the front, um, the, the, the blower fans all went out, right? So there's no air in my car at all. Not even like, I'm not saying AC's out, I'm talking like the fan literally is done. And like all this different kind of stuff in there, and it's like, my car does zero to 60 as well. It just takes 15 seconds to get there, and you're sweating by the time you get going, you know? And it's like, how many of you guys would want to take my car versus this car? You know what I mean? And I think it's a really good analogy because my car is actually the version of joy I think most of us settle for. It's on our own terms. It's what we figure and what we that. And what God offers us when it talks about his joy, it's something else altogether. It's like a different level. Does that make sense? And you're going to look at what Jesus is saying is I want my joy to be in you and, and I want it to be full. Here's the thing. If you're here and you put your faith in Jesus, this is something that he has for each and every one of us. See, one of the mistakes we think about joy, my wife told this to me, I thought it was so good, but you know how like they have the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and self-control. A lot of us, we look at things like love, self-control, patience, and we say those are non-negotiables. We need those things, right? Like it's important to have those things. But when we look at joy, for whatever reason, we just think of joy as optional. Isn't that true? Like some people have joy, some people don't. We almost think of it like a personality trait, right? The joyful people are like the bubbly ones and all happy like that. And like, you know, like they, they like, I don't know, they do this or something. But like, <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? And I know for me, like, I'm a joy-filled person, but I don't do this. Like, I just want to dispel this one thing is joy is a personality trait. And the other thing is that some of us really believe that, oh, maybe I'm just not meant for joy. It's like, do you think you're not meant for love or patience? or Because it's actually yours. Does that make sense? Yeah. It's not an optional thing. It's something that we're actually meant to cultivate. Mm -hmm. And even this word right here, if you read it in Greek, it's actually the word, it can be translated perfect. Um, perfect can be translated more accurately in our culture as mature. So in other words, what this is saying is that his joy would be in us and that we would be able to have this joy mature inside of us. There's a process to letting that happen. So when you read this, if you just look at the words here, these things, the question you want to ask when you see the scripture is, okay, I see this, I want this. 
And if Jesus is saying, hey, I told you these things so that this would happen in you, then what you want to ask yourself is, what are these things then? And that's what we're going to look at. We're going to back up 10 verses before and kind of walk through this because Jesus lays a pathway in the middle of the last dinner he has with his disciples before he passes on how we can experience his joy. John 15, 1 says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it so that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Now, you got to understand, in this culture, the people Jesus was talking to loved wine. They loved wine. A lot of them had vineyards going through that. They were just super familiar with it. So when Jesus would teach, a lot of times he would use the analogies of things that they were already familiar with. If he was here locally in Hawaii, he might talk about kalo. Have you ever sat with people that are, you know, from the, the land and they'll talk through like, hey, how this works is a lot of ways that you can see how life works. You know what I'm talking about? That's what he's doing here. Except here he's saying there's three parts to this analogy. There's the vine dresser, there's the vine, and then there's branches that come off of the vine. So as he's talking through this, the vine dresser is going to be God. Jesus is going to be the vine, and you and I are meant to be the branches, okay? That's how this whole passage is going to work. So what he's trying to say here and what he's saying is that as branches, you and I, we're actually created to bear fruit, to have good things come through us. And then he goes on to say, remain in me and I in you. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, but must remain in the vine, so neither can you unless you remain in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. The one who remains in me and I in him bears much fruit. From apart from me, you can do nothing. Okay, so see this word remain? He's going to use this 11 times in this passage. It's this really, really potent word that's basically saying like, like the one that lasts, the one that stays when anything else goes, the one that just maintains this connection. It's, it's a strong word. And you may be like me. I'm a little bit more visual. So I, I want to illustrate this. So can you bring that up for me, please? I'm going to illustrate what he's basically saying in there. Now, this is also going to be a test for those of you guys that are from Hawaii and not from Hawaii, okay? So this is my, um, my mango tree. Now, first thing you're going to notice about my mango tree if you're from Hawaii is this is not a mango tree, okay? So don't judge it. It works, right? And second thing you're going to notice is I taped the mango to this non-tree. But it's going to work for the analogy, okay? You with me? Okay, here we go. So this is how this works. Jesus is saying you and I are like this branch, and we're actually meant to produce fruit. And the case we're talking right now is even joy. Joy is meant to come out of us and be ours. It's just the nature of it. But the thing about this mango tree is now that I pull it off and that, it looks great. But what's the fate of this mango tree from this point forward? It's done, is it not? Because it's like this, this mango, it's ripe. It's moving forward on that. And this tree, it's green. And if you were to come up and smell it, you can smell the fragrance of life in it. But although those things are true right now, it's actually now disconnected from the source. See, the reality of this branch, this branch has no power to produce fruit. The only way it can produce fruit is actually to remain connected to the source. And what Jesus is actually trying to get into us is to let us know you are meant to produce fruit. But contrary to how so many of us think, we think we have the power to produce it on our own. Look at this, the bottom. For apart from me, you can do what? Nothing. Nothing. Not something, not a nod from that. I don't know about you, but I find myself trusting in myself a lot to produce fruit. Anybody else? Feeling like I'm the one that can muster up this joy. I'm the one who can manufacture this. And what Jesus is saying is you've got to understand this branch analogy. You have to stay connected to the tree. The tree's the source of life. See, for a lot of us, what we end up doing is we do this. is We, we stay connected to the tree, and then we feel good, and then we disconnect because we got it from here. Then something happens in our life, and it's like, oh, my gosh, I need like another, like, 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 like dose, if that makes sense. And we'll run over here and connect again. And then we'll discount. You see this kind of pattern on it? 
And it's like, that's the, the pattern we think we're living in. It's like, oh man, I, I had a rough time. I need a dose of joy. I'm going to come over here to God and get my dose. Or I'm going to come to church and do that. But listen, joy is meant to be a lifestyle. You're meant to experience it perpetually. The only way that happens is by staying connected to the tree. See how that works? That's what he's trying to hit over and over and over. And so the first one of these things we see when he's talking about this pathway is staying connected to Jesus. Now, for those of us that are church people, it's like, okay, I've heard this before. I kind of get that. But I, I want to show you a little bit of a difference because sometimes what we think of when we think of God is we think God's always there. He's always with me and he's for me. Now, is that true? Totally. God's always with us. He's for us. He's working in that. But I want to point out a difference is you can be, there's a difference between being with somebody and being connected to somebody. I'll just use this analogy right here. These little miracle devices that we use. Have you ever been to restaurants lately and watched people as they eat? Go, go out to lunch one of these days and just watch. Everybody's on their phone. You know what I'm talking about? Now, they're with one another, but are they really connecting with one another? Right? You know what I mean? Or like, like you could use a marriage analogy. You could sit on the couch together and this person that I spent a ton of my time with, we're in each other's presence, but it doesn't mean we're actually connecting. You know the difference in that? When Jesus is saying, remain in me, he's saying, stay connected to me. Engage with me. I want to interact. I'm always with you, yes, in proximity in that. But there's a difference between knowing he's here and actually connecting with him. You see the difference? And that's the lifestyle he's trying to cultivate in us. You know, over these last couple of weeks as a church, we've done a couple of things. We did that three-day fast. And a lot of people actually came up. Some people came and told me a story. It's like the easiest fast I ever did. And I just experienced like this joy. Or we've been doing like this 21 days of prayer. By the way, if you want to jump in, you totally can just scan the code on that. But every morning, kind of waking up, and we're kind of praying similar prayers as like a launching off point. And we've been doing, even on top of this, like that whole pray first wristband thing. But you know why we've been doing all this? We've just been trying to get you to stay connected to him regularly and start living the lifestyle with him. If you're experiencing more fruit, you know why it is? It's because you're staying connected to the tree. It's not because of all these religious disciplines. It just puts you in a heart posture that's different. The disciplines are meant to help point us to the connection. And when you do that, fruit is born inside of our life. It's just a normal reality of how it works. He goes on in verse 6 to say this, If anyone does not remain in me, he's thrown away like a branch dries up, gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. So let's get back to my mango tree. Three weeks from now, what does this look like? It's brown. The green's gone, right? It's going to get really, like you can crack it. It's, gonna, it's just the nature of it. Why? Because it's no longer connected. And what he's trying to get across is like, if you don't do this, like this is where you're going to find yourself. Anybody felt dry before? Empty on that kind of thing, just going through there? A lot of times what you're going to find, it's not because, oh man, I don't believe in God. It's because we're not connecting to him and remaining in him. You see what I mean? The next thing he's going to go on to say is this. He says, if you remain in me, which we've already heard and looked at, and he adds something, and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it'll be done for you. My father's glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. So if you remain in me and my words remain in you, what he's saying is, is if we're able to like basically keep his words in our heart, something starts to happen. And I'm going to show you through this part right here, there's actually a promise that's made available to you. Uh, I'll share a story from like, I think it was like five days ago. Uh, I woke up one morning and all of a sudden this phrase came to me, like oil on Aaron's beard. Now, that might sound like a strange phrase to some of you, but other people recognize, oh, that's actually a scripture reference. That actually comes from Psalm 133. So this thing, it's like it was in me because I, I try to read the word as much as I can. I don't do it every day. I wish that I did, but sometimes I just, I don't get to it or I don't prioritize it. And then the next time, like, I really want to make sure I do this. But I, I knew this reference a little bit, and so it prompted me. I got to go find this. I figured Psalms 133, and when you read that psalm, it's a short one, 
But it basically says this. It says, how blessed it is when brothers dwell in unity. It commands a blessing. Like oil running down Aaron's beard. And what I felt like very, very clearly from the Lord in that moment is that day, you need to fight for unity wherever you go. Sure enough, within that day and next couple of days, there were certain situations that presented themselves. And typically, I'm a pretty like easygoing person that works together. There's a couple instances where it gets hard for me. And one of those instances came up. And it was like the Lord was telling me ahead of time, I want you to fight for unity right now, not what you want in this moment. Because what I would want is I would want God to vindicate me. Makes sense? That's how, actually how I would pray. God, you know what they did and what happened on that. So just protect me from this and protect that and going through. You see what I'm saying? And he's like, no, no, no. I want you to pray for oneness. This is what gets wild. Watch the promise that goes with this. So keep his word in us is the point in that. But watch the promise. Ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Now, I don't know about you, but I love scriptures like this. Okay, ask for whatever I want and it'll be done for me. God, I'd like $10 million and a Tesla. You know what I mean? Like, that would be awesome. Still driving the Sienna. So what happened? Did it not work, God? I don't understand. Here's how this works. These are connected. When his words are in you, it shapes what you ask for. If his word wasn't in me in that day, in that situation, I would have asked him to vindicate me. But I'm not asking him to vindicate me. I'm saying, God, give me the patience and the grace to hang in there in these conversations. God, give me the compassion and the love to move towards this person. And God, get rid of the fear because what I really want to do is run. You see the difference? His word's dwelling in me and it starts to direct. I'll, I'll use a couple analogies just to point out other ways this works. Um, sometimes when it comes to relationships, people are looking for romantic relationships. Uh, some people, when they're younger, they'll pray something like this. God, give me somebody that's like hot and awesome and makes me happy. Amen. You said ask for whatever I want. Now, the reality is, okay, great. Ask for that and that. But when you actually start to get his words in you, you'll realize a lot of your life is going to be about journeying after him and what he has for your life. It's going to be about walking through difficult situations and being able to see him guide you. It's going to be about raising kids, which is no easy task. And when his word starts to dwell in you, you start to pray a little different on this. It's not just, God, give me somebody who's hot, awesome, and you know, makes me happy. You start to pray, Lord, give me someone to partner with as I start to seek after you. God, give me somebody that I can lean on when we start to raise kids together. God, it, I realize when I read your word, it's not that this person's there to make me happy. Actually, what you want me to do is love them like you say, that I'm supposed to lay down my life for them. So help me find a person that I can see what you're doing in the life, and I'm willing to do that. See the difference in prayer on that? Mm -hmm. When you start letting his word in you, it shifts how you pray, and then God loves to answer prayers like this. I'll give you one more analogy. Sometimes people will pray, God, like, I want to be blessed more. Give me a bigger house, God. I'd love a bigger house. Now, is there anything wrong with praying that? Not necessarily. But for some people, it starts to look a little different. Some people feel like, oh, man, God, what you've told me to do, you've called me to gather people in my home, to invite neighbors in, to, like, I'm hosting a group in this, and I'm at a place, God, where I'm out of space. I'm doing what it is that you told me to do. I'm out of space. I need you to provide more space. Now, God loves to answer prayers like that because you're already partnering with what it is he's doing in your life. You see what I'm saying? Now, it might be that he gives you a bigger house, but maybe he doesn't. Maybe he provides an alternative place for you to meet with other people and to gather our friends or neighbors. And if you're praying like that, you will be equally as stoked because you're not just focused on you and your kingdom. You're focused on him and his kingdom. Does that make sense? When Jesus taught us to pray, he said, Our Father who is in heaven, holy is your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, right? Then give us a day, daily bread. In other words, when I keep your kingdom first, I'm able to ask for whatever I need to be able to do whatever you've asked me to do. We flip it, right? We do. God, here's my laundry list, my dream thing. Here's what I want. Big house, this, money, that. How come you're not answering any of these things? 
It's like that's not the kind of fruit that you think that you want in your life. I mean, even go back to the prayer of the relationship. A lot of the young guys I disciple in that when it's like, oh, just give me somebody that's hot and awesome. I'm like, some of you guys, hot and awesome is going to blow up your life right now. You know what I mean? Like you're not really wanting that. You really want substance. You just don't know that yet. You see how this works? God really starts to shape us when we allow our, our, his words to dwell inside of us. Verse 9 that says this, Just as the Father loved me, I also loved you. This blew my mind this week when I was studying this. Check this out. Do you think, or let me ask it this way, how much do you think that God loves Jesus? Like, nah, he's kind of okay with him, like this much and that. Like literally when you think like God's heart towards Jesus must be absolutely crazy, right? Jesus, like the way he lived, obedience, sacrifice, his son, his heart must explode when it comes to Jesus. What Jesus says is the way that God's heart explodes when he loves me is also the way that I love you. Not wild. Like you're that loved. He's that fond of you. He's willing to serve that much. It's just, it's crazy. But watch this. It's a third remain. So he says, remain in my word, remain in me, and now remain in my love. Now here's what I want to point out about this, and this might get tricky for some of us. There's nothing you're going to do that's going to affect how much God loves you. His love for you is not conditional on you can't earn it, you can't perform for it. And it's up to us to respond to his invitation now to remain in that love. So whether you respond to that invitation does not mean that love comes and goes. His love is consistent. But according to Jesus, what he's saying is, is there is a way to remain in that love, to keep participating in, to see that flourishing. See, when we think of love, there's different, we, we define it kind of culturally today. When we think like love when it comes to marriage, we'll say something like this. What love looks like is I want you to support me, to think and feel good things about me no matter what, and to partner with me. Okay, is that part of marriage? Sure, that's part of marriage. But when that's the full definition, what it typically looks like is if you don't do these things for me, I'm not doing these things for you, right? Love, that's not what the Bible calls love and marriage. What the scriptures paint love and marriage is, is, yeah, I want you to do these things for them, but I also want you to even sacrifice for them. Like, oh, that sounds even deeper. Well, we'll push it even one level further. And not only do I want you to do these things and sacrifice, but I want you to do it regardless of what they do to you. And you're like, oh, that's a big thing. Yeah, that's called biblical love and marriage. And it's that kind of love that transforms marriages in the world around them. We settle for a lesser version of this. You see what I mean? When it comes to parenting. So then it's like, hey, parenting, you know, you want to really make sure your kids know that they're supported and that you're their, their friend and that you're always there for them. Is that part of good parenting? Totally. Is that all parenting is in that love? Not according to the Lord. He's going to say if you really love your kid, you're also going to discipline them. Because yes, you're your, their friend, but you're also their parent. Even if you don't believe the Bible. I mean, maybe you don't believe it at all. Just think about it like this. Think about it from like a, a brain development. Our brains, our prefrontal cortex does not fully develop till 25. And so you're telling me like a 12-year-old kid, you're trying to give them the ability to make these incredibly complex decisions as an adult that I'm just going to support you no matter what. And it's like they're not ready for stuff like that. They need to be guided. They need to be shaped and formed. They need to be disciplined. That was God's plan. That's why he gave them a parent. You see how this works? And when you really love them, are you going to support them? Absolutely. Are you going to have their back? Absolutely. Are you going to discipline them? I hope so, because that's a form of love. It's not trying to, like, punish them. That's different. Discipline helps motivate and shape things for the future. Punishment just tries to, like, be mean from the past. Does that make sense? Shaping, molding on that. That's the higher form of love in that. I'm going to say something that might be a little touchy in that, but I, I want to say it because it's in Scripture. It's very, very clear. For us, what's happened with God sometimes is we think that loving God means that our intentions and our heart are good towards Him. And that's definitely part of it. That's a beautiful thing. But Jesus is going to say, when you really love me, you're actually going to follow me. 
You're actually going to practice the things that I practice and tell you to. And when you start to do this, this is the key to actually remaining in my love. Now, in this culture, sometimes we, we buck against this a little bit because it feels a little bit weird. But what you've got to understand is, like, God made us. He knows how we're meant to operate. So when he tells us how to go about something, he's trying to move us into a place of life. He's not trying to take from us. I'll give you like a practical example when it comes to like even like sexual intimacy, like the way that God designed it. And there's some people um, that what they'll do is they'll, they'll start because of pleasure or anything else, they'll just um, start looking at different things on the computer kind of at night. And it's like, hey, this brings me joy. It's not hurting anybody. It's fine. And what scripture is going to teach you is this is actually robbing you. It's not actually going to bring more blessing in your life or bring more joy. It's actually going to bring you this superficial thing that's going to damage the true thing that he has for you. And if you don't believe it, just because the Bible says, just go look at like secular research on how this affects relationships and degrees of satisfaction in life. It's just this pattern that he has. And so it's incredibly important. At the end of the day, when it comes down to it, he's going to say, you've got to also do what I tell you to do. And when you do what I tell you to do, it's like you're positioning yourself in a place to experience joy. Some of us in here aren't experiencing joy because there's something in particular that God's asked us to do and we haven't done it. And we're like, well, how come he's not like giving me blessing and joy in that? It's like he's giving you an open invitation. But part of this is you have to do the things that he's explaining because it's how it works. And if you'll make a change in this area, you'll be shocked how much life and joy will come into your life. Why? Because God doesn't love me unless I obey him? Nope. God's love for you is absolutely unconditional. But it's up to you if you want to take a step and remain in his love and experience all the things that you have or not. Does that make sense? These different things are just a picture on this. Now watch, so this wraps. We're back to where we started. These things I've spoken to you that my joy may be in you and your joy may be full. I already told you this, but this word is the, can be translated the word mature. And if I had to say any one last thing, I want to say this, is it's time for our joy to grow up. You've got to j grow your joy up and mature it. And you do so by starting to practice these things regularly. And you'll be shocked at the life that will come inside of you. It's a promise. His joy will be in you. See, part of the contrast for me when I think of joy, my version of joy is usually contingent on my circumstances. If life's going good, if my marriage is going good, if my finances are going good, I feel good. His joy, the mature version, transcends circumstances. Chaos breaks out. I stay connected to him. I hide his word in my heart, and I do what he tells me to do. And even though it's chaotic, I feel life and joy inside of me, and it's the craziest thing to describe. Why? Because I'm, I'm connected to him, that branch in there. There's an overflow out of this. See, the thing about this is, Looking at this, if you're a church person, this isn't new to any of us. Is that not true? It's not like, oh, stay connected to Jesus. I didn't know that one. Keep his word in my heart. Never saw that. Do what he tells me to do. The problem for a lot of us to experience joy is that we think we need to learn something else. And I don't know if we do. I think we need to do what we already know to do and practice it regularly. When you start to do that, you'll be shocked the life that comes right out of you. Because it's what we're meant for. Think about this. When did he tell them to do this? It's like the night before he dies. It's like the dinner. He's literally sitting there being like, tomorrow I'm going to lay my life down for you. I'm going to reconnect you back to God. I'm going to open the heavens for you. And what I'm trying to get you to do is to understand this is the key. This is how you access all of this. You cannot do it apart from me. So whatever you do, stay connected to me. And for me, I wish I'd tell you I stay connected to him all the time, but even this week, there's moments where I just found myself on my own strength. And then I go to practice this message. I'm like, what am I doing? Like, I need to just stop and just get with you, Lord. Now, I get it. We have a lot of things going on. The average person I talk to here in Hawaii, between two couples, or two people, to, like a couple, most of us are working three jobs between two of us. Raising kids, different stuff. It's not the amount of time, it's the intent. It's like, like, again, the marriage analogy. You can stay connected going to Costco. Do you know what I mean? You can talk to your partner in that same reality. Or you can just go about busyness and never connect at all. We think it's about the amount of free time we have, and I think it's about the heart posture. 
about making the most of the moments that we have. And I just, I hope it comes across clear. He's just, his invitation is for us. And for some of us, it's time to not just stay on our own. Like, teach me a new tool so I can do this by myself. And to realize, connect me back to the source. Because apart from him, I can do nothing. If you're here and you're not a Christian, the invitation is for you as well. Most people think that oh, i got to get my life together before I come to God. It's like, you can't get your life together before you come to God. That's the whole point. You know what I mean? None of us can. That's like all the people think like Christian thinks they're better than other people. It's like, I don't know what Christians you're hanging out with, but like the ones I hang out with are terrible. You know, like in the sense of like, they're just like broken, normal people who don't have all the answers. They just know the one who does and they cling to him and he's really good to them and he watches over them and we're not perfect, but he just is so good. And I just want to re-invite us again today as we just close right now is to come back, cling to him, and let's grow our joy up. You're meant for it. But the question is, will we take him up on this invitation or will we not? Will you bow your heads with me as we close in prayer? God, thank you that when you speak to us, you're not trying to condemn us. Matter of fact, if there's anybody that feels condemned, God, I just pray you would just... Just wash that away. I know that's not your heart. What you're trying to do is move us to a place of life, change our direction at certain times. As so the Lord, I just I pray for those of us that have made a decision to follow you already. And God, I just pray right now, we just we repent. We repent and say, God, we're sorry for doing things on our own strength, for not being connected, for thinking it's about information, for loving you in a place where it's just the intent of our heart and it doesn't overflow into who we are. And today we just remember, God, like joy is a person, your joy. And we're meant to live a lifestyle of joy and we cannot do that apart from you. So we connect today and I pray that as people would connect, Holy Spirit, would you supernaturally produce the fruit of joy? May it be in them, may it be full, may it be mature. Help us to practice this. Help us to be a, a people that just joy is our normal. Not because we're forcing it, it's just because you give it to us. In the same way, I just want to pause and talk to those of us in here that may not be Christians. You might have been invited by a friend or been coming for a while, and you've never made a decision to follow after Jesus and to connect to him. And today you're wanting to do that. I want to give you an opportunity to do so. And in a moment, I'm just going to have you do something simple. I'm just going to have you just lift a hand. Everyone else's head's down. It's not like a magic in lifting your hand, but it's just making a decision in a moment. And what you're saying in this moment is this. It's not that you've got your life together, you've figured everything out. What you're saying is, is I've done it on my own long enough and I want to make a decision to not do it on my own, but now to turn and follow after Jesus, to start a relationship with him. And because of what he did on the cross when he died for us, that's what makes that possible. That's what makes us right with God. So if there's anybody here with your, everyone else's eyes down, would you just lift your hand right now? You say, I want to start a relationship with Jesus. Go ahead, you can do that now. Can I see some hands in here? If you're in any of the theaters, see your hands. That It's not about me seeing it. It's about the Lord. If you're online, listen, wherever you are, it doesn't matter on that. But what I want to do right now is I want to lead us. We're going to pray a prayer, all of us together. You can put your hands down. These aren't magic words because the magic is about what's happening in your heart. And that's what he cares about. And so church, can we all pray this together? Just pray it loud and repeat after me and say, Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for loving me. Today, I want to make a decision to follow after you. I want you to be my Lord, to be my Savior, and to be my leader. I know I've made mistakes, and I'm sorry. Today, I choose to follow after you. And God, that's all of our prayers we close here today. We want to follow after you. We want to be connected to you. We want to be like you. We want to be with you. We just love you. So I pray that you would just help that to just be more and more apparent as we choose to remain in your love and remain in your joy. We love you. We praise you. And all God's people said, amen. 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 Hey, would you welcome those who said yes here today? It's awesome. So good.
All right, well, that is it for today. Next week, Pastor Dave has a killer message. Two weeks from today, we're going to be doing the whole football thing. I'm going to wear the exact same jersey because I only own one jersey. So don't judge me. It's going to be an awesome day. Invite somebody to join us, and we'll see you guys then. Hey, thank you for watching today. I want to invite you to subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a single video or live stream. I encourage you to share this video with a friend. And if you're blessed by this message, you can support God's work by clicking the Give button on the right or on our New Hope Windward website. Don't forget, you can join us live every Sunday online or at one of our New Hope Windward locations. And once again, thank you so much for watching. May God bless you.